Good evening and welcome to Lowell Observatory's ongoing celebration of our Lowell Discovery Telescope. Uh, my name is Kevin Schindler and I'm the Historian and Public Information Officer at Lowell Observatory. And it's really a thrill to be able to come um, to you every month and, and talk about the Lowell Discovery Telescope, um, the many discoveries it's made, the discoveries we hope to make with it, and, and just the breadth of research and the people doing that research, um, which is probably the most important thing is having a world-class telescope is important, but it doesn't mean anything without world-class scientists. And so uh, we have two with us today, and um, we're gonna talk about how the LDT is used um, to study galaxies. And we're probably also gonna talk about some other things um, about getting into the field of astronomy and, and mentors along the way and things like that. Um, because astronomers, it, it's, not a, it's not something you do alone. You have, you have colleagues, you have advisors, you have mentors along the way. Um, and today we have two um, people that are at different stages of their career. And so I think it'll be fun to talk about this, this process of becoming a, an astronomer. Um, we have Dr. Deidre Hunter. And Dr. Hunter has been at Lowell Observatory um, since the 1980s. She earned her PhD from the University of Illinois and um, studies dwarf galaxies, among other things, and is one of the world's experts on that topic. Um, and I should also mention that um, something that's not unusual at a place like Lowell Observatory, um, Dr. Hunter does research, but she also is very interested in outreach and reaching communities, especially that are underserved. And so more than 25 years ago, she started a program reaching out to the native communities of, of the Four Corners area, I guess, um, especially Arizona and New Mexico, um, Navajo and Hopi and other tribes. And that program is thriving, going stronger than ever. Um, and that's, that's been a, such a great contribution in inspiring, hopefully, future scientists. Our other presenter tonight is Haley Archer. And Haley's not nearly as long along in her career as, as Deidre is, um, it's exciting because she's just on the front end. Um, she's um, a freshly, I guess, freshly minted PhD student. Um, so she'll, she'll be jumping into her PhD studies at Arizona State University while also being associated with Lowell Observatory. Um, and so I, I think it's gonna be great tonight, two different perspectives. Um, Deidre has used the telescope um, for research. Um, Haley has been a telescope operator with the Lowell Discovery Telescope. So there's there's different there's a lot of different things we can cover tonight. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. So what we're gonna do is listen to these um, women scientists. And first of all, we're here from Dr. Hunter to talk about, here's some of her research. And then um, Haley will talk about uh, research that she's involved with and also her PhD program. And then we'll just open it up to informal discussion. Um, you can send in questions anytime and we'll monitor them in chat. We'll try to get those to those at an appropriate time. So they'll each talk for a little bit and then we'll just have an open discussion. Um, and we've got about an hour. So um, if you have any questions or, uh, you know, about the Lowell Discovery Telescope, um, galaxies, dwarf galaxies, especially because we've got experts here, um, just, just send those questions in. And at some point I'll prod Deidre to talk about the picture um, that's showing here, which she immediately identified because this is one of her objects. So Deidre, let me turn it over to you to um, let's hear about some of your research. Okay, now I'm going to share my screen and go into slideshow. Okay, uh, Kevin, can you see this, everything? You see yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to tell you about a project that I'm doing um, with LDT. And so I need to um, start by explaining where this project came from. And uh, it, the project is uh, ultra deep imaging of uh, dwarf irregular galaxies. So let's start with what a dwarf is. Um, and dwarf galaxies are actually the most numerous type of galaxy in the universe, but they're very tiny. Um, this is a typical spiral galaxy, and this is a typical dwarf uh, galaxy. 
and um, they're shown roughly to the same relative scale. Um, so you can see how tiny, some, they can even get tinier than this or even a little bit larger than this, but um, they're, they're tiny galaxies. And this is the picture behind Kevin. <laughs> I like, I really like this galaxy, uh, this picture a lot. So I often, I often show it to illustrate dwarf galaxies. Um, uh, the, these, this uh, very bright orange star and these other orange stars uh, around the field, those are, um, those are uh, stars in the Milky Way and they're just in the ways, but uh, all the little uh, knots that you see in this galaxy, those are stars in that, in this galaxy. This galaxy isn't very far away, so we can see individual stars. Um, and so the little dwarf galaxies, they're just lumpy little galaxies. They don't have spiral arms. Um, but what's really interesting about them to me and that what, what brought me to studying them many decades ago, is that, um, well, they do what, what uh, some astronomers say they shouldn't be able to do, which is they make new stars. So a galaxy like the Milky Way and other spiral galaxies, um, we're constantly making new stars. We make clouds, we bring clouds of gas together, and the gas then goes on to form new stars. But the dwarf galaxies have much lower gas densities than, than the spiral galaxies. And so the model that we might use to understand how the clouds form in spiral galaxies say that dwarf galaxies shouldn't be able to form those clouds that then form stars. And yet we can see here in this galaxy that it is forming stars. These clusters of blue stars that you can see here. Can you see my cursor okay? Yep. Yep. Um, those clusters are, are young clusters that have formed in the last oh, five to 10 million years. And um, so that's where star formation is taking place in this galaxy today. And, all, and most of the dwarf galaxies are forming stars. And so I want to understand how. Um, so a I undertook a project um, um, well, um, at least 10, let's see, I published the paper in 2011, so that was, so I, I started a project 12-ish years ago to look at the very far outer stellar disks of the dwarf galaxies. And um, the, the motivation was that we don't understand star formation in the central parts of the dwarf galaxies, so let's push it to an even bigger extreme. Let's push out to the far outer disk of this, the stellar disk and see what's going on outside, out the out, far outer parts. The um, gas density in a galaxy drops as you go from the center outward. So the gas density is dropping as you go out to the outer disk. The stellar density is dropping. Um, and so in the far outer disk, um, the gas density is even lower than it is in the center. And so the issues of how the stars might form out there is even more extreme. So um, I took these, these five uh, dwarf galaxies and I got very deep images in the V band, which is in the green. And I did, um, I, I divided the galaxy up into annuli and I measured the brightness of the stars in those annuli and I plotted the brightness per unit area here in mag as a log versus the distance from the center of the galaxy. And this in this kind of a plot, if you have a, a straight line, that is the brightness drops as a straight line, that's called an exponential disk because since this is since this is a log, it's the brightness of the stars is actually dropping off exponentially. Um, and and I found that in all of these five galaxies, the the star the stellar disk just went on and on and on. And I ran out of signal to noise before I, I never saw the end of the disk. The edge of the disk. I just ran out of, of photons. Um, 
And so I was very intrigued by this outer stellar disk and I wanted to know how the stars got there. And there's sort of two ways in which they could get there. The first is they formed there. But as I said, the gas density out there in this far outer part is much lower than it is in here. So the difficulty of forming that gas into clouds is even more extreme. Um, and so um, if we find young stars, young star clusters out in this, if we can prove that stars are forming out there, then that's um, sort of a, a kick in the pants for the theorists <laughs> to figure out how, that, how they're doing it. <laughs> um, but there is another possibility. In spiral galaxies, um, simulations have shown that stars can be um, gravitationally scattered by the spiral arms. So the stars are orbiting around the center of the galaxy, minding their own business. They encounter a spiral arm, and the spiral arm is a concentration of dust and gas and stars. And so it has a little more gravity than the rest of the disk, and it perturbs the orbit a little bit, and it can scatter the stars out into the outer disk. So stars in this planet scenario, the stars would form in the inner disk and in the inner part of the disk and then be scattered out there. But there's a consequence of that. If stars are formed in here, by the time they're scattered out here, um, they're old. So if scattering is what's putting stars out into the outer disk, then the outer disk should only be old, old stars. Now, could this, of course, spiral galaxies don't, I mean, dwarf galaxies don't have spiral arms, so what are they going to scatter off of? Well, uh, um, my collaborator, Bruce Elmgren, and his collaborator, Kurt Stroop, did a numerical simulation of a dwarf galaxy. This is, the gray here is the numerical dwarf galaxy. And they distributed the stars in that galaxy from the center, ignoring the center, from this point outward, just in a, a constant density. So this is the the dent, this is the this over here, we're looking at the surface density of the stars as a function of radius from the center of the galaxy. And they just distributed them evenly across the whole disk. Then the little red and blue um, things that, in, that they threw into the disk are, eight, are hydrogen gas clouds. And so the idea is they started it running, the, uh, the simulation running, and the stars would scatter off gravitationally. They hit an H1 uh, uh, a gas cloud, and, and they would be scattered out into the outer disk. So fast forward down to the end of their simulation, um, and they have produced, by this scattering off of the gas clouds, they produced an exponential disk, plus a break, which we often see, um, we often see that in, in the galaxy's um, surface brightness profiles too. So um, this seems to suggest that scattering stars in the outer disk might be a possibility and it could create an exponential disk. Um, but as I said, the scattered stars would be old. So when I, when LDT came along, um, I was very interested, I, the project I had done I mean, 12 years ago, I just did one filter. So I knew nothing about the colors of the stars or, or the colors of the outer disk. I just knew their, their existence. And what I wanted to do now was to do a larger sample, I had 36 galaxies I wanted to do. And um, I wanted to do it in four filters, ultraviolet, blue, green, and red, so that I could then do, um, I could look for blue things, look for blues, um, objects in the outer disk. And then I could also look at the colors in the outer disk and ask what population of stars 
would be required to reproduce those colors. So it could tell me the star formation history of the disk. It could tell me they're all old, or it could tell me there's a mixture of young and old, or something like that. So the camera, the large monolithic imager, uh, LMI, um, Phil Massey was the PI of a uh, principal investigator of a proposal that he submitted to NSF that uh, got funding to build that camera for LDT. And it was the design of the camera took into account this project, this and projects like it. That is the desire to observe to very, very, very faint levels. Uh, in surface brightness, meaning not just a faint star or a little object, but a light that would be um, extended over um, an area. So that's good for, so that's my kind of project. And it's also important if you're going to image comets and look at the coma uh, through narrowband filters and other projects like that. And so, um, and uh, when the telescope was being built, they paid a lot of attention to scattered light issues because that would be the death of a project like this. Okay, so um, I decided, so I have 36 galaxies, but I wanted to go equally deep in all four images and using what I had learned from my pilot project, I knew how much time it was going to require in the visual filter, and then I estimated the other filters from that. And so it was going to take two nights of perfect observing per galaxy. <laughs> um, so I needed, um, by perfect, um, I can't have any moon, I can't have much in the way of clouds, I need reasonable seeing, um, and yeah, I guess that's all. Um, so I, I needed very good uh, conditions and I couldn't observe if there was any moon up. Um, and then there are parts of the year when the sky is dominated by the Milky Way. And so there aren't galaxies up then. So, um, so I started observing October of 2014. Um, that was eight, almost eight years ago. Eight, and I finished the 10th galaxy in April of this year. <laughs> and it's been a long project. Um, I didn't do 36 galaxies. I've only done 10, but I'm satisfied. <laughs> oh, no, you have to do them all. No, I can't. Um, uh, the problem was I had to share the telescope <laughs> with other people and, and uh, it wasn't always clear and so forth. But at any rate, um, so I want to show you one galaxy. Um, at this point, um, uh, with the help of some students uh, and, uh, and, and working on it during the pandemic, <laughs> sitting at my dining room table, uh, uh, I finished, uh, we finished co-adding um, all of the images together. So um, I would take multiple images of each, in each filter over years uh, of a particular galaxy. And then I had to ship them and scale them and combine them to one final image. Um, and uh, that's now done. So I, I wanna show you um, one of the galaxies. And this is just one filter. This is the green filter. So um, the color here represents the intensity in the green, it's not really color in the galaxy of the stars. It's just so the color, by displaying it in this way, you can see the, in, it's easier to see the structure in the inner part as well as the structure in the outer part. This co white contour out here represents the surface brightness that I was aiming for. This picture here is just to show you the galaxy. This and this bright object and this and this. Again, those are Milky Way stars just in the middle, in the, in the um, foreground. Um, but this is the galaxy. And so now this is the same 
image, but now I'm going to display it so that all of this part of the whoops, galaxy, well, here it is, <laughs> is now overexposed and you just see it as red, okay? So the edge of this red is a surface brightness that people traditionally think of as the edge of a galaxy. It's 25 magnitudes per second squared. Um, and so this is sort of the, that sort of traditional outer part. This out here represent, the contour represent 29 magnitudes per second squared. And this blue area in here that you can see, I hope you can see it well, is um, that's the outer disk and that is what I want to study in this galaxy. And so you can see, um, you can see already that there is stuff in the outer disk. There's all this, I call it scruff, all this scruff out here. Now, some of this is just foreground stars. This might be a foreground star. Um, I don't know about this. That could be, that could be, that could be. Some of this could be foreground stars. And then there's fainter stuff that's just in, in out here in the outer disk. Um, and so one of the things I now have, this is just one of the four filters. So I want to measure the brightness of, of these objects in the four filters to find out what color they are. Are they blue knots? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> it went by itself. <laughs> um, so this image is the same galaxy, but now I have um, combined three of the filters, um, ultraviolet blue and visual in red, in um, blue, green, and red. Um, and um, so that you can see some semblance of color. The color is meaningless because it, the color of anything depends on how I put these three filters together, how I display them. So it, it doesn't tell you really what the color is. I have to do that, I have to measure it. But again, here is the scruff that I was pointing out in the previous image. The stuff that I want to find out what it is. Is it, is it likely things in this disk? And if so, is it young? Or is it background galaxies seen through the disk or foreground stars? And to give you a, a better uh, feel for the galaxy, this is now, this is the same image, but now I'm showing you more of the image. There's actually even more than this, but um, this is enough to show you the structure of the galaxy and then all this background stuff. And one of the things, so I had, had a summer student in uh, summer of 2020, Ella Costello, who co-edited many of the images, and she did this. She put, uh, she did this for this galaxy, put these three, put three images together in color, and we saw over the whole disk, this whole, this swarm everywhere of little blue dots. And I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> how am I gonna tell, how am I gonna tell, and we, and she showed that they weren't foreground stars, they were background galaxies. We'd gone deep enough, we were seeing the sea of background galaxies. You can, you can see them all over, these little blue dots everywhere. So now the, I realized the problem I had is that I need to distinguish um, things. If I see a blue dot, like this blue dot, is that, is that a blue cluster in the, this galaxy? Or is it a, one of these blue-ish background galaxies behind the disk? And um, that's what I'm working on now is I'm trying, identifying these, all the objects in the image um, and then measuring their brightness. And then the idea I'm, <clears throat> I'm hoping work is to measure the, the density of those objects outside of the galaxy, compare them with in the outer disk and their their colors and their brightnesses to see if I can distinguish objects that stand out as not being 
maybe more objects than there should be statistically given the background that might indicate they're in the galaxy or they have bluer colors or something. Anyway, that's where I am right now. Okay, well, that's, that's great. <laughs> yeah, there's so much to talk about with this. And, and we, we do have a question. Um, uh -huh. In looking at the, the dwarf galaxies, um, what percentage of galaxies, known galaxies, what percentage are dwarf? And also, how do these compare in size to something like the Magellanic Cloud? Okay, the Magellanic Cloud is a, is a big dwarf. It's a, it's a dwarf irregular, but it's on the, um, there's a range of uh, sizes and masses, and it's at the, the, the top end of a dwarf. Um, and um, at the, in terms of percentage, I don't know the exact number. I don't know what the number is, but I can give you an estimate. If we look at the local group of galaxies, which is what the Milky Way is a part of, um, there are three spirals. There's the Milky Way, Andromeda, and, the, um, and M33. So two large spirals and one smaller spiral. And then there are about 50 dwarfs known so far. And we keep finding ones, Pe not me, but other people are looking for tiny dwarfs in the local group and, and some have been found in just the last 10 years. Um, so, you know, three versus 50. Is this something, something like, say with exoplanets that we know enough now to project that you would find these throughout the universe. Um, we've, we've just found so, you know, a certain number, but we, we guess that they're probably all over the universe. Yes. Um, they, they, because they are small and faint, they're very hard to see at high redshift um, and detect at high redshift. So we can look at the, the nearby universe and count them um, and just accept there are, that they, form, that they formed uh, when the rest of the galaxies formed. We can tell that by looking at the galaxies that are nearby. Mm -hmm. And so there should be dwarf galaxies everywhere. Oh. And uh, I want to clarify something. You stated that um, you were saying that dwarf galaxies are a type of galaxy, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know you don't work on, you work on bigger things, but dwarf stars are types of stars, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's dwarf planets. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I'm just throwing that in for a, it has nothing to do with the conversation, but the, some of the confusion with naming that dwarf planets technically, by the definition, are types of planets. Yes, right. Um, astronomers so, aren't very clever about naming things. <laughs> Dwarf irregular galaxies are, be, are named that because they're small and they're irregular. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's great. We'll, we'll talk to you some more, Deidre, but if you can uh, stop sharing your screen and you let's bring on Haley. Um, a different stage of your career, but it's exciting because you're, you're following the path that Deidre did. Um, you're just earlier on. But let's, let's hear about um, your research and your use of the LDT. Yeah, so my name is Haley Archer. I'm a graduate student here at Lowell Observatory and ASU, and I'm working with Deidre. And I'll be using the LDT for a project for my dissertation, tracing the extended disk of WLM. And can you describe what WLM is? I will. Or what it stands for? <laughs> yes, um, so it stands for Wolf Lundmark Malat, so the three people responsible for discovering it. And it is a dwarf irregular galaxy in our local group. And it's about 3.4 million light years away from us. It has a low metallicity, about 13% that of the sun, and a low mass, about a thousand times less than the Milky Way. To answer a question we received earlier from Chris Simonson, its total mass in stars is about 10 million solar masses, and its total halo mass, once you include the dark matter, is actually about 10 billion solar masses. So what's it, when you say low megalicity, what does that mean? 
So that means that the elements astronomers are again not very clever here. So we call metals everything on the periodic table that is heavier than helium. So anything that isn't hydrogen and helium, we consider a metal. And so those build up over several life cycles of stars and um, these end up having a really low metallicity and that is something that impacts star formation. So it's something we see in these dwarf irregulars and that's another factor of why we wonder how stars are forming in these galaxies. It's considered to be an isolated galaxy because its distances from both the Milky Way and Andromeda, two of the large galaxies in our local group, indicates a low probability that it has interacted previously with either of them. So because WLM is relatively isolated and it's nearby in our local group, which means we can resolve the individual stars and star forming regions in it, it makes a great laboratory to study how stars form in these low gas density and low metallicity environments. Without that star formation, uh, probably being caused by gravitational interactions with those larger galaxies. This particular project started when our colleague Dr. Bruce Elmgren got time on the Spitzer Space Telescope to trace the extended disk of WLM through asymptotic giant branch stars with its IRAC imager in the 3.6 and 4.5 micron filters, which are in the near infrared. And in doing so, we can again look for this evidence of star formation occurring in the extreme environments of the far outer stellar disks. The Spitzer Space Telescope was an infrared telescope with a primary mirror of about 0.85 meters. So compare that to the LDT, which is 4.3 meters. It had three instruments, the infrared array camera, IRAC, the infrared spectrograph, the, and the multi-band imaging photometer for Spitzer. Our program, as I mentioned, used IRAC, which the imager has a field of view of 5.2 by 5.2 arc minutes. And again, compare that to the LMI imager on the LDT, which has a field of view of 12.3 by 12.3 arc minutes. So LMI's field of view is more than double what we had here. Spitzer launched in August of 2003 and retired in January of 2020, but its planned mission was actually only two and a half years. This was based on the amount of coolant it had on board, but even then it didn't run out of that coolant until 2009. So it's still got six years instead of the two and a half that it planned for. After that, it became what's known as the Spitzer Warm mission without that coolant. And that was actually what our program was part of. So this is when it could only use the IRAC instrument and it could only use the 3.6 and 4.5 micron filters. And our program was actually also part of the last chance call for proposals, meaning it was one of the last science programs that used Spitzer. Here is the last view of Spitzer from Earth in January of 2020 before it retired. It was originally trailing the Earth in a heliocentric orbit, but after it turned off, it will now drift away from the sun. However, it will swing by Earth again in about 51 years. And AGB stars are used to trace the disk of a galaxy because they're one of the major polluters of the dust that makes up the disk. They are also bright in the infrared, which is why we use Spitzer. And AGB stars are stars in their final evolutionary stage of their life cycle. Stars with masses between one and eight solar masses will go through an AGB stage which means our sun will eventually become an AGB star. What I have here is called an HR or Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. An HR diagram shows how stars of different masses will have different temperatures down here and luminosities at different stages in their life. 
This particular HR diagram shows the evolution of our sun. Our sun is currently about halfway through its main sequence stage. And the main sequence stage is the stage where stars will spend most of their life. In about four and a half billion years, it will stop burning hydrogen into helium in its core and begin to ascend what's called the red giant branch. In this stage, we will see it get colder and brighter. Then it will begin burning helium into carbon and oxygen in its core for about 10 million years on the horizontal branch. And once that stops, it begins to ascend the asymptotic giant branch. In this stage, nothing is burning in the core anymore, but that helium burning moves to a shell outside of the core. And then there's also a shell of hydrogen burning above that. And so these two shells burning cause the star to essentially oscillate or pulse. And you have these heavier elements or metals uh, being created in the star, which is then brought up to the surface. And the farther they get from the core, the cooler they get, which they will condense into dust. And then those pulses will cause stellar winds that then push that dust away from the star. So here is just an animation showing that pulsating and the mater material ejection of an AGB star. And down here is an actual AGB star, Myra, in the optical or visible light. But if you could look at it in the ultraviolet, you would actually see all of this material that it's ejecting as it moves through space. At the end of the AGB phase, the star enters the planetary nebula phase, which is a lot of the pretty pictures that we see. So here is all of the material that it's lost in its late evolutionary stages with that carbon and oxygen core that's no longer burning in the center. And once that material disperses into the interstellar medium, the core is left behind and it's what's known as a white dwarf star. Here are two of our images from the Spitzer data in the 3.6 micron filter. Again, that's the near infrared. We have a north and a south field with the center of the galaxy marked by an X. These images are actually several images mosaic together, which you can tell by these jagged edges. And we also have another set of these images in the 4.5 micron filter. I've overlaid in a blue box here the LMI field of view to show how useful you know, the large uh, field of view of LMI will be when we image this area again. And so far, I have cataloged all of the detected stars in these images, excluding the crowded center of the galaxy. And I've done photometry on them, which allows me to determine the magnitude in each of the filters of the stars along with the colors, which is the difference in the magnitudes between the two filters. And with that, I created what's called a color magnitude diagram. So channel one here is the 3.6 micron filter and channel two is the 4.5 micron filter. A color magnitude diagram is a variant of the HR diagram I showed you earlier, which where the difference in the magnitude down here is the color, which is indicative of the temperature and the magnitude in a given filter is indicative of its luminosity. And this allows us to determine what types of stars we're looking at. So we can figure out which of our stars are AGB stars to trace the disk, since not all of the stars that we detected with Spitzer are AGB stars. Some are red supergiants and some are even main sequence stars. However, if we want to more accurately constrain uh, which stars are AGB stars, we need to know what their colors are in multiple filters, since that will help us better constrain their temperature. And for this, we need the LDT. So we have 16 quarter nights coming up in November and December, where we'll image that same area that we did with Spitzer. And we'll do it in four additional filters, U, B, V, and I, which is ultraviolet, blue, visible, or green, and infrared. And then that will allow us to determine which stars are AGB stars. So we can trace the extended disk of the galaxy. And it will also allow us to look for evidence of star formation happening in the outer disk, which as Deidre mentioned, would be really neat 
because the low gas densities in the disk uh, shouldn't be conducive to forming stars. So I am excited to get back out to the LDT and get more data for this project so that we can learn more about what's going on in these tiny galaxies. Thanks, Haley. That's great. Hey, can you talk a little bit about the observing you've already done with LDT? Yes, so I personally have not observed, but I was a telescope operator, so I got to help a lot of other astronomers observe um, for about a year before I started my PhD. So, so what, and what was the nature of being a telescope operator? What, what's a typical night for you when you were doing that? Yes, yeah, so you get out there about an hour before sunset and you get the telescope up and running. Um, they kind of uh, used analogous to the, uh, like a pilot getting ready to fly where you have to make sure everything is running smoothly um, because you don't want to be the one that breaks the $53 million telescope. And so you get that up and going and the astronomers will either get online or come out there depending on what type of observing they're going to be doing. They'll maybe take twilight flats um, and then you will check the focus. You'll get the instruments up. You'll use the wave front, make sure all of the scene is good and the active optics. And then you hand the telescope over to the astronomer and they do their program and you help them out and you make sure nothing goes wrong. And it's typically a, a night. Is there a typical length of an observing session? You were talking about quarter nights. Uh, yes, so uh, it can be anything from a full night to a quarter night, depending on what the program requires. For me, WLM is only visible for a short amount of time and for a short duration of the year. So that's why we only needed quarter nights. So that worked out well for us. Yeah. So you were talking a little bit, you were talking about, you know, using the Spitzer data and then how you're going to move forward with the um, LDT. Can you kind of compare, we're talking about a large Earth-based telescope to a space-based telescope that's not as large, um, but can you talk about how they compare and why, you know, a space-based telescope um, is such a cool thing, even though it's a smaller than LDT? Maybe just talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, the thing that the space-based telescope offers is it doesn't have the atmosphere that it's looking through. So you don't have to worry about whether there are clouds, whether the, the scene is bad. So that's where even if the telescope is smaller, you can still get some really good data from it. Um, in terms of comparing LDT and Spitzer, they're very different because Spitzer was an infrared telescope. And so they're looking at different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. So both useful for the project. Yeah, okay. Now here's a question from Martin. It's not necessarily what you guys work on, but maybe you can address it. Has it ever been proven that planets inside a star's planetary nebula radius stir up the matter contributing to the nebula's image? Um. As to my, and I'm, my knowledge isn't complete, <laughs> but um, to my knowledge, no planets have been discovered around stars with planetary nebulae. And I think it would be difficult because there's all this gas and dust and stuff around the star, which might make it hard to, to actually detect the planets. Um, but then there would be the question of have people done simulations of what would happen in that case to the planets and what they might do to alter the nebula. And this is where my ignorance about that field, um, I, I don't know if they, that's ever been done. Haley, do you know anything about that? Uh, I have not heard anything about that either. So it's an interesting question. It really is, yeah. So Deidre, you were talking about your um, 36 galaxies. And um, at this point, you're not necessarily planning on 
um, observing them all. Although, you know, I think you should. I'm not <laughs> sure how long that would extend your career. <laughs> but, so, but you feel like the number that you've looked at gives you a statistically sound um, number to be able to make some broad generalizations. Yeah, I hope so. Um, Ten. I mean. So with the regular galaxies, every galaxy is special. <laughs> uh, and so, um, but 10 is, is a nice sample. It's a good sample. And um, I wanna see what those, that sample has to show before I do anything else. Uh -huh. has, has your study of looking at dwarf galaxies altered our understanding of how galaxies are formed in general? Of how they're formed? Or form evolve, yeah. Um, so there, are, well, it's raised lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's mainly what it does, because <laughs> um, there's always another question, no matter what you learn. Um, and so I think um, a couple of. Uh, random things. Um, there was a graduate student who worked with me um, years ago, uh, Hong Jin Zhang, and he um, he took the data that we had at the time, which didn't go out as far as the data work that we've gotten with LDT. So we had images, but they didn't go as deeply. Um, but we had done surface photometry in 11 different passbands, so UBV, JHK, H alpha, FUV, far ultraviolet, near ultraviolet, and then he also had a grab Spitzer 3.6 micron images. And so he, he put all of these data together and he had developed software for uh, fitting those colors and asking what pop stellar populations do you need to make those colors? Uh, and what's the most likely combination. And so he basically what he did then was to look at the star formation history as a function of radius from, from the center of the galaxy outward. Um, and he asked, um, he sort of, because it was, he, he, he asked in sort of three big time bands, one was, the last, the, the most recent 200 million years, one was the last billion years, and one was the lifetime of the galaxy. And he asked, what is the star formation rate in those three pass bands, as a fun, in those three time bands, as a function of radius in the galaxy? And what he found was that the disk of the dwarf galaxies the star forming, I mean, the stellar disk is the stellar disk, but he found that the star formation activity has shrunk inward over those three time bins. And um, people had uh, previously studied spiral galaxies, and they ha had developed this idea of an outward growth of the disk of spiral galaxies. And so what he called, what he found was that there was an inside, there was an outside in growth of the dwarf galaxies. So it was completely the opposite of spiral galaxies. We don't know why yet, <laughs> but that, that was one thing that we learned. Um, Uh, I don't understand that question. Um, and um, so that was one thing. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's really intrigued me uh, recently, and Haley is working on this too, is working on this, is um, people had said that the structure of the clouds that form stars should be different in in dwarf galaxies than they are in spiral galaxies because of the, the lower metallicity, the lower amount of dust. Um, when a cloud forms in a spiral galaxy, you have um, 
um, the outer part of the cloud absorbs ultraviolet light that would just that would that would break up the molecules that are formed inside, and so you would end you um, in the dwarf galaxies that have less of these heavy atoms and the dust. This ultraviolet light can penetrate in further, and so you end up with a very small core in the center the, of the cloud that is actually molecular. So we then went and used ALMA, which is a radio interferometer in the Atacama Desert. It observes in millimeter wavelengths, and we mapped, and we mapped WLM, in fact, we mapped WLM and so that we could find the little molecular cores in that galaxy. So Haley has this beautiful star forming region that you see all of this ultraviolet light from the young stars in it. You see these tiny, tiny, tiny little molecular nuggets inside this huge shell, protective shell around the region. And the question is, what is going on actually inside of that, um, in, inside of that star forming region? What gas is the, it, are the stars actually forming out of? Um, because the little, the little molecular nuggets that we look at in, molec in CO, carbon monoxide, look like they're too small to have something going on, much of anything going on. So it's, it's a very different structure to a star forming region compared to a, in a spiral galaxy. And so to me that what ha, figuring out how all that picture all fits together inside that star forming region is one of the a big question that I'm hoping that Haley and our collaborators can figure out in the next few years. There's no pressure there, Haley. Yeah. <laughs> Got this. Your fine. graduation relies on that. <laughs> well, we've got about we've got about nine minutes left, so I want to change tack a little bit. Um, first of all, we want to give a shout out to um, one of our listeners who donated um, some money to support our programming, and the username is Harry Toe One. Um, but however you derive that name, thank you for supporting the program. <laughs> um, thank hey, you. Something we were talking about before we went live was was um, your, how you both have um, gotten into astronomy and your career direction and mentors along the way. Deidre, you've been in astronomy, I won't say how long, but you got your PhD in 1982 um, and arrived here a little <laughs> within a few years of that. <laughs> so you've been in the field for a while, but you came along when it was certainly even more of a male dominated field, even though it still is, but it was even more so then. Can you talk about what it was like to get into astronomy? Why, why did you decide to go into astronomy in the first place? Um, I wanted to become an astronomer because of Neil Armstrong mm -hmm. <laughs> and the other Apollo astronauts. Um, my friend and I, the summer between sixth and seventh grade, decided we wanted to be the first women astronauts. And, um, but because I wear glasses, I couldn't even, I couldn't. And so I decided if I can't become an astronaut, I'll study what's out in space. So I'll become an astronomer. And so, you know, I sort of locked in and didn't let go. <laughs> <laughs> well, there seems to be a, a beautiful symmetry here because you went into the field of astronomy um, and the Lowell Discovery Telescope um, was, we're celebrating it the 10th anniversary, it saw first light in 2012. And the person who helped us dedicate the telescope was Neil Armstrong. Yes. There's, there's some perfect symmetry there for your career, it seems like. Yes, it was a great honor to, to meet him. Yeah. And in fact, he looked through the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Um, they, yeah. Stephen Levine and others put an eyepiece on it, which is, yeah. that's not a bad um, amateur telescope, a 4.3 meter telescope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Haley, how about you? How, why did you decide to go into astronomy? Yeah, I grew up on a farm in North Dakota and we had really clear skies. And so I would always kind of go outside in the middle of the night and just spend all my time out there trying to 
figure out everything I could about space. And that's not a lot from just laying on the ground outside. But I think it was my dad, actually, that we were watching some Nova show. And he was like, this is what you're doing all the time. You should do that and be an astrophysicist. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. And so I'm like, D3, <laughs> I just stuck with it. Yeah. Well, you know, your story certainly has strong um, reminders of Clyde Tomba, who grew up on a farm in in um, in Kansas, in his later years growing up. And what else is there to do on the farm in Kansas? Look at just like where you grew up, look up at the stars at night and dark skies. And and that led him to Lowell Observatory as it led you to Lowell Observatory. So um, I don't know, he made a pretty good mark. So we'll yeah. look forward to seeing what mark you, you leave as you progress with your career. So how about how about mentors along the way that got you that got you help steer you? Deidre, we were talking earlier um, after you got out of college or um, got your PhD, you had a postdoc. Um, maybe you can talk about that and who you worked with. Um, well, first of all, in uh, as a graduate student, um, I had a fantastic um, thesis advisor. His name is Jay Gallagher uh, at the University of Illinois and uh, the astronomy department. And um, he was very supportive. And whenever um, there were issues of you can't do this because you're a woman, he would fight for me. <laughs> and uh, he was great. But then um, a couple years later, I went off to the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism of uh, the Carnegie Institution in Washington, D.C. And um, that's where Vera Rubin was. And I hadn't real, you know, I'd heard people talk about role models, but it didn't mean anything to me until I met her. And then suddenly it was just, wow, here is a role model. And it really made an enormous difference to me because she was so relatable. She was so human. She, I could see, you know, I, I, I could just see that, you know, that there was somebody I could relate to there. Um, and so it, it made a big, it made a big difference to me. She, she was certainly, a, by what you're saying, an excellent role model. And she had a bit of a success, successful career in astronomy. <laughs> can you just, we only have like a couple minutes left, but you can, can you, um, briefly tell our viewers who she was, and then Haley will ask you about uh, who's mentored you, because we have this this kind of um, family chain, I think, yeah. um, going on here. Uh, well, Vera looked at something everyone said was boring, because they knew what the answer was, which is she looked at the rotation, the speed of rotation of stars around the centers of the galaxies. And what she found was that they didn't rotate at the speed they were supposed to. They ro rotated as though there was a lot more mass there than we could account for. It's now called dark matter. And her that work really the idea of dark matter was driven home and it revolutionized our view of the universe completely <laughs> and in her spare time um she managed to be a mentor to you and so many others yeah yeah she so, was a very strong and fierce advocate for women and she life. and she started the field i don't know the 1950s or so um, yeah. or where it was even more challenging. Mm -hmm. So she helped lay the groundwork that you took the baton from her. Yeah. And then Haley, Haley, who's been a mentor for you? A loaded uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> I've been really lucky actually, because I have two advisors. So I have Deidre here and I have Dr. Roger Windhorst down at ASU. And so getting two advisors who both have fought for me has been really great and I get different perspectives and I get multiple people I can ask for help on things. So I have also been very fortunate. And that's that's really astronomy as a field where, like we said, you're not standing alone in it. Um, you work with others, others mentor you, you mentor others. And it's and it's like so many things you pass it, pass it on as it were. And it's just inspiring to hear these stories of you know, what inspires you two and how you're inspiring people 
that are watching this and will continue to follow your science. Um, so thank you both for joining us. We're out of, out of time. That's how this goes. It goes really fast. I think, I think our final message, um, we have one last comment, I think is a good comment to end on. And our donor, Harry Toe One, um, who made the donation, said, Dr. Hunter, you would have made an awesome astronaut. Thanks for what you do. And, and I think I, that's a good sentiment. Um, all of us thank you for what you, what you both do um, for the research, for helping us understand the universe better, and for inspiring us all um, to want to look up and learn more. So thanks for joining us tonight. Um, thanks to our behind the scenes crew, Nate, Nate Nice, Maddie Mooney, and Heather Craig. And thanks for everybody for joining us. Um, we'll join you again next month as we continue to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Good night. <laughs>